I'm on it. It just took a minute, you know what I mean. Don't be so reasonable, you know you said. <laughs> I hear nothing but good stuff. Good evening. Welcome to the Anacorta City Council meeting of April 8th, 2024. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, Mr. Franciak, would you take the roll, please? Mr. Fantini. Here. Mr. Young. Here. Mr. Walters. Here. Ms. Cleveland McGrath. Ms. Moulton. Mr. McDougall. Here. Ms. Hubick. Here. Thank you. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? All right, announcements and committee reports. I've got a couple of quick announcements. Uh, just a reminder that uh, next week uh, at 4 p.m., Monday the 15th, Department of Ecology will be host, will have a public meeting that we will host in the uh, Anacortes City Council Chambers, and that's uh, the A Avenue landfill uh, uh, public comment. Uh, also, a reminder, uh, mark your calendars, Saturday, April 20th, 9 to 12 is a very popular residential spring cleanup day. Again, uh, get all your household cleaning done and bring your residential garbage and yard waste to our operation facility. No charge. You just have to show that you're, uh, um, you're a resident in Anacortes. And then also that day, uh, it seems appropriate, that afternoon, there will be a number of Earth Day events in town, uh, the 20th, and a parade at 5 and another at 8 p.m. First is the uh, parade of the... Uh, I'm getting it wrong. Procession of the species followed by a uh, luminary parade at 8 p.m. So uh, that's all I have. And council uh, and, uh, committee reports, Housing Affordability and Community Services Committee. Mayor Miller. Mr. Walters. The Housing Affordability and Community Services Committee met May, April, um, Thursday of last week, April 4th to talk about the May 9th visit from the Senate Committee on Local Government, Land Use, and Tribal Affairs. Uh, we are preparing an agenda for a, a meeting with them um, where we can talk about some of the housing issues in Anacortes, some of the potential solutions, some of the progress that we have made. And uh, I think that we are next scheduled to meet uh, this coming Thursday. Okay, uh, next is the planning committee, but I believe that was uh, canceled. It's normally right before this meeting. Okay, so we'll move on to uh, public safety committee. Hello. Ms. Hubie. Thank you. Public safety met back on the 2nd um, with an update from the fire department. The academy has pretty much um, completed for their new hires. Graduation is happening this Friday the 12th and ships will start being filled in after that. So uh, Chief Harris gave us the update that everything is on schedule for full deployment of the new unit shifts starting June, July 1st. They have had a few water rescue events, but other than that, they are getting ready for their normal spring and early summer stuff. And then they wanted to let us know that the next publication of the A-Town Magazine will have an article about the FireWise program and fire protection program. So as we get ready to head into um, the dry summer months, it will give us an update of what's possible for the city and then what um, citizens can be doing um, for fire prevention. Then we had Chief Floyd um, give us an update about the regional uh, basic law enforcement academy. They were thinking that it was gonna be held out in Mount Vernon at Skagit Valley College. It has since been relocated to Arlington, 
which is a little bit further than Mount Vernon, obviously, but it's a lot better than going all the way out to Burien for a lot of their new hires. Um, they are still going to be able to provide instructors as much as they can for the classes out in Arlington. And it looks like the first class could actually happen this summer, which would be great. Um, for staffing with public safety, the police, as of December, they were at 100% of the allocated 2023 numbers, and they are adding to the levy lid position total for 2024. And then Chief Floyd also let us know that the virtual reality training system that they have been given approval to purchase um, has been bought. It will be coming here soon, and so they'll get everything set up for it. Um, really excited about the program. It'll be a great tool um, for the new hires that are coming in. And the thought is also that it will be something that can be used to help train the Citizens Academy in the future as well, even though the timing isn't quite right for this year. And that's it. Any other announcements or committee reports? Any questions for the committees from non-committee members? Okay, uh, moving on to item four, this is public comment. This is an opportunity for any member of the public that wishes to address the council on anything that is not on our agenda. We have contracts on the agenda tonight. Uh, so uh, I'll just go right to public comment and I appreciate you all signing up and neat handwriting, but I still might butcher your name. So uh, when you come up to the microphone, please uh, say your name and the city you live in for the record. Uh, first up, I have Connie Russell signed up. EMS levy is the topic, so come on up. And again, even if I say your name correctly, go ahead and say your name again and uh, city you live in. Connie Russell, Anna Cordes. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the EMS levy proposal that's been presented to Skagit County voters is both deceptive and excessive for the following reasons. Number one, the explanation of the rate increase. The rate increase quoted in the voters pamphlet indicates, quote, the renewed levy would be imposed at a rate of 47 cents or less per thousand of assessed valuation, which is a 3% increase from the rate approved by voters in 2018, unquote. That statement is true, but a very important missing fact is due to the significant increase in assessed property values from two 2018 to 2024, the EMS levy is actually currently 30 cents, 30 cents per thousand. So the EMS levy increase being requested is actually 30 cents per thousand to 47 cents per thousand. Number two is the revenue to be generated. The voter pamphlet does not provide information as to the actual increase in uh, the revenue proposed uh, that will be generated. However, EMS has indicated that if the proposed levy is approved, the current revenue of 9.7 million annually will increase to 14.4 million. That's a 48.4% increase. Number three, the impact on property taxes. The voter pamphlet fails to provide information as to the estimated annual impact of this proposal on taxpayers. However, various published sites have indicated that the rate increase for property assessed at 555,000 will be an additional $94.35 per year. And number four, the Anacortes Ambulance Budget. The 2024 Anacortes City Budget shows that ambulance services for salary and wages, wages will increase 49% this year. With this significant staff increase already included in the Anacortes City Budget, what is the need and how will additional funds for the county EMS levy be used? For all of these reasons, I urge you to vote no on Proposition 1, force the county to come back to voters in later in 2024 with a more realistic rate increase and a more transparent explanation of the rationale. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is 
Uh, Bill Collins, and topic is Fifth Street Habitat. Is Chris to talk? I think it's already on if the light's okay. on. Okay, well first of all, I want to and thank you for canceling that uh, roundabout there at uh, Safeway. Mr. Fantini, thank you for standing up for that. And, and if you could Great say day. your name one more time in the microphone and, oh, and I a little thank, bit. Oh, your, your <laughs> name, Mr. your name. Oh, oh, sorry, Bill Collins and and you live, in what? you live in Anacortes. Yeah, Anacortes, okay. 37th Great. Street. Thanks. Neighbor with Mr. Fantini. First thing, thank you for the canceling the roundabout there at the Safeway. Mr. Fantini, I think you had a lot to do on that. The second one is some comments on the Habitat for Humanity. I'd like for the council to arrange a meeting for the community and have the council there, the architect, uh, and the habitat folks, and anybody else that would uh, provide input for that and have a little meeting with the uh, residents, those who are affected, so we can understand what the plan is. I've heard a lot of comments, the plan is too small, it's not too many people, blah, 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 but what is it going to be really? And I think that would calm down some of the residents because they don't really understand I don't think they understand, at least I don't, how are you going to get all these people and cars and stuff into this little plot with five residences. So maybe somebody can help us with that uh, and so we can understand it better. Maybe we'll vote for it or somewhat, you know, some, maybe some two residents rather than two residences rather than five. I don't know. Anyway, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Beth Bell, and subtopic is cinema and Fifth Street Habitat. Hi, Beth Bell, Anna Cordes, uh, movie theater. I'll keep this one short. After watching and listening to the last couple of meetings, it saddens me how this simple change in the lease agreement was not only handled, but how you voted. It was asked, what is your agenda? I, too, asked that question. Do you plan to take over this building in 2026? I'm asking for transparency. On the Fifth Street, Habitat for Humanity. Affordable housing. I would really like the City Council to clearly define what affordable housing is and or contact me as to where I can find that definition. History lesson. Fidago Flats was allowed five levels, stating it would be affordable. Is it? Who monitors it? It's not the city. So how can you stipulate we will allow five levels and then not monitor how those rates are applied? The other area that was owned by the city, I believe, was between 21st and 20th off a of commercial and queue. The townhouses went in there, supposedly to be affordable housing. They start at 516,000. According to a brochure that was, not, that was re recently reviewed, the average income of Anacortes is 80,000. How is 516, 545, 649 affordable? We have affordable housing between the Anacortes Housing Authority, between the Anacortes Family Center, the parallel 49 apartments that just went in. Top of D Avenue was supposed to be affordable housing where the Testament property was. The other issue that I have with Habitat for Humanity is that there is no parking, no storage, uh, there's nothing in the plan with regard to how the facilities are going to be maintained. And the city hasn't made concessions in the past with regard to parking. Why are we starting now? I believe that you're setting a dangerous precedent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up I have Linnea McCord, and topic is Fifth Street Habitat. Linnea McCord, Anacortes. 
So I'll put some context in this. The purpose of the building, the words you're going to hear, climate change, affordable housing, changing the Growth Management Act, they have a purpose. It's banning single-family residences. How do I know? I come from California. I'm a refugee from California. California now allows up to four dwellings, as many as two duplexes or two houses with attached units, to be built on almost any lot currently zoned for a single-family residence without local approval. Only cities are allowed to veto the development when there is a threat to health and safety, historic districts, or fire hazard zones. Now here's democracy in action in California. More than 250 cities opposed it. They said there's no price caps or other assurances of affordability. It will destroy the character of the single family neighborhoods, drive down property values, undermines the ability of local governments to responsibly plan for the types of housing that the communities need, circumvents the local government review process, and silences community votes, voices. Now, why would we be doing this? Like I said, I invite everyone in the council and in Anacortes to look up the World Economic Forum. And while you're at it, go to the United Nations International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives .org, I C L E I dot org. Olympia is a member of that organization. Fascinating. And Olympia, in its 2021 Community Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Strategy Analysis, can you imagine who created it for them? I-C-L-E-I, Local Governments for Sustainability, October 9, 2023. So this is coming from the World Economic Forum through the United Nations. United Nations is not our buddy. They're not our friend. They don't care about our freedom but they certainly care about our housing and our affordability and climate change. And AI says that ICLI is an international organization for local governments that plays a crucial role in promoting sustainable development and addressing pressing urban challenges. And one of those challenges is affordable housing. And in that context, it says Anacortes Washington likes to explore how ICLEI and local initiatives are addressing affordable housing. So if you go to the World Economic Forum, you'll see they're exceedingly concerned about affordable housing, about climate change, about changing everything. And what they want is a 15-minute city that you won't be able to travel, that you don't need a car, and they will tell you what to drive, how to drive, if to drive, and they will determine everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is... Becky Mifflin, Habitat Fifth Street. Hi, Becky Mifflin, Anna Cordes. I am strongly against Habitat, for, or for that matter, anyone else building five houses on the parcel on West Fifth Street. Why weren't we, the neighbors, advised of the city wanting to build these houses? There has been zero signage or letters sent to us. Yet, on December 14, 2022, Ryan Walters posted the following on Facebook, and now he has deleted it. Why did you delete the, your post, Councilman Waters, Walters? Sorry, I apologize for that. Here you go. Habitat for Humanity is coming to Anacortes. Our Housing Affordability and Community Services Committee has worked with Habitat for more than a year on this project to ensure long-term affordability and maximum utilization, five 1,200 square foot cottages of the limited vacant property the city owns. We're excited to finalize the paperwork and get them moving to help five families build equity in homes that they can afford. This is from Facebook, like I said, December 14, 2022. If you notice, he stated that the city has worked with Habitat for over a year, that means 2021. In two and a half years, I would think that the city council could have reached out to our neighborhood for input and posted signage at the property. Not a darn thing. I asked the council members to reconsider these five houses and build only two houses, or better yet, leave it is as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, we have Suzanne Rohner at Anacorda Cinemas is the topic. 
Su Suzanne Rohner, Anacortes, thank you for this opportunity. I was here last week about the cinema and I'm back. I have more to say, I didn't have enough time last time. Um, I'm very concerned we're gonna lose our theater. Um, the small town theater is part of our shared American culture and I hate to see it go. Um, currently, anyone who wants to purchase the cinema building and assume the land lease must have at least five years experience in the movie theater business. The current tenant is asking that the lease be modified to allow a subleasee to satisfy that requirement. This ask is not unreasonable for the following reasons which appeared in the March 27th Anacortes American. A council member stated that they learned from three former city council members that generated the original lease in 2001 that they viewed the lease as temporary and their intent was to ensure the theater would be successful. And number two, the current tenant and owner of the building questions her own compliance with the requirements of the lease since the death of her husband in May of 2021. She stated, I don't have any experience in operating a movie projector or the digital projectors or knowing where to order a movie screen. So technically, as far as I'm concerned, I do not consider myself having experience in the movie industry. So why is the council so adamant that the five-year experience clause apply to any future owner when the current owner has been out of compliance since May of 2021? The council's opposition to modifying this lease is confounding. There was concern the potential purchaser wanted to take over the whole property, including the parking lot. This concern was squelched by the mayor who stated the council would have to approve any changes in use of the property. Other council members were concerned that amending the lease would make the property more valuable and result in a higher asking price. It is unclear why any change in the value and the asking price would be of any concern to the council. The value of any property is determined by what a buyer is willing to pay and what a seller is willing to accept. The Anacortes American reported the current owner saying she is considering demolishing the building and paying the remainder of the lease through 2026. In the same article, a council member stated, it is incorrect that the cinema would go away in 26 if the property owner cannot sell the building. The member also said the building would revert to the city's ownership in that scenario, and there is no reason the city could not rent out the theater, unless, of course, the theater has been demolished. I am again questioning the motivation of the city council's actions. I am again asking the council if their ultimate goal is to regain control of the property, the sooner the better, and build multi-level, multi-family housing on that land. I asked that question last week and have not res gotten a response. I'm asking it again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't have anybody else that signed up, but okay, I see two hands, so, uh, and the green, I guess, okay, it doesn't matter to me. You can work it out, and as long as you come on up and state your name and where you live and uh, keep your remarks to three minutes, it'll be good. Xu Wan Mu, Anna Cortes. Thank you. After reviewing council member Mr. Walter's response, we have concerns on the following. First, there is a financial impact on the city's balance sheet for gifting a public property to the Skagit County Habitat for Humanity. Second, because of the le legal hurdle for gifting public property, there can be legal liability and the financial exposure to the city. Three, as for choosing five units instead of two units for the parcel, Mr. Waters responded, the rationale is to make the most progress toward improving housing affordability and the availability in Anacortes. Housing affordability is driven by the income of the home buyers versus home prices. It is driven by the demand and the supply of the local housing market. Employment rates, wages, and the central bank monetary policy. What appears to be the driver for the five units is, the lot is slightly over 15,000 square feet, and the new code 
the minimum requirement for a single family unit is 3,000. So 15,000 divided by 3,000, that's why five. That's the maximum density possible for the square footage for that parcel. Is the denser the better? The answer is no for both the tenants and the existing neighbors for reasons many of the neighbors have already voiced. Lastly, council members Waters stated, the project support compatibility with existing neighborhoods by promoting high quality design. As for how, the explanation is, the new code was developed to ensure the compatibility as well as the high quality design. Therefore, the compatibility is not evaluated on a project by project basis. This logic is flawed. It is called circular reasoning. I still have time, I will give an example. Circular reasoning is A is true and B is automatically true. So I say this book is written by a space alien. Why? Because this book says so. So that is the logic that uh, we have a hard time to understand. In summary, we strongly object the Habitat proposal as presented in February 20, 2024 agenda. Let's not chase the maximum density allowed by the current code at the expense of common sense. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I saw one other hand up and yep, come on up. Kelly, <coughs> Kelly List, Anacortes, West Street City Build. Here's excerpts from a letter from Tina Tate of Habitat to the volunteers. The council members are getting pushback from neighbors on West Fifth and have heard little from supporters. She then encourages them to email, call, and attend meetings. She further states, if you'd like an example of what to write or say, please contact, and she gives a name. She continues, the city is the driving force and wants to lease this piece of property to Skagit Habitat to build five cottage homes. Volunteer response, when I first heard about the planned Habitat build on West 5th, I eagerly took the training to be a construction volunteer. My enthusiasm ended when it was revealed that five houses were to be built on a lot that is marginally large enough for two. Yes, there is strong neighborhood pushback against the project as it is currently designed, as it will undoubtedly greatly change the character and the quality of the neighborhood. Isn't Habitat concerned about keeping the spirit of goodwill with neighbors in the places they build? So instead of trying to get Habitat volunteers to lobby the council, it would be very much appreciative Habitat would ask the council to modify the plan, such as, um, we understand that the neighbors are strongly opposed to this plan. We suggest that the plan is modified to limit the build to two houses in keeping with the character of the neighborhood. This will maintain a spirit of goodwill with the neighbors, some of which we're planning to help the build. Tina responds, yes, Habitat wants to keep goodwill with the neighbors we built, neighborhoods we build in. The city council and HACS team had asked for five units on that property and that is what we presented. We are not opposed to reducing the number of units but it is entirely up to the city since it is their property. My comments. This clearly implies that the city is working behind the scenes with Habitat to build support for their agenda with the purpose of outnumbering and marginalizing the neighbor's concerns. Habitat is launching a corporate lobbyist campaign to promote this build regardless of the impact on the neighborhood, shrugging their proverbial shoulders and saying, it's not us, we're just doing what the city asks. This does not engender much trust in their willingness to have goodwill with the neighbors or much faith in their building a functional, sustainable, sustainable housing project. To be clear, I am not faulting volunteers. I am concerned that their support of this project with limited information will be valued by this city council. It is easy to support a plan that doesn't impact your daily life, neighborhood, or your city ward. To Habitat, as well as the city council. Tina said, they are hardworking everyday people. Well, so are we. We're hardworking, good people. And we should be regarded just as highly as the clients you will bring into the neighborhood. 
please listen to us when we say this. Overcrowded, this overcrowded plan will compromise our diverse little neighborhood and negatively impact our daily lives. Besides, we want a plan that your clients, our future neighbors, will love too. Thank you. Appreciate Thank your you. time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Public comment? I forgot to check online. Okay, uh, and I will move on to our consent agenda, items A and B. Council. Mr. Miller. Ms. Hubick. I make a motion to approve consent agenda items A and B. Second. Motion by Ms. Hubick, a second by Mr. Young to approve the consent agenda. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> motion carries. On to item uh, six, which is other business. Item 6A, this is a contract award. Anacortis climate element, element. This is a discussion item with uh, possible action. And Mr. Coleman will be presenting. Good evening, Mayor, Council. So, um, as we discussed at our last meeting, the city received a $500,000 grant from the Department of Commerce, which the Council uh, accepted at last week's meeting. Uh, now we're at the point where we're going to uh, spend that money. So as for background, uh, House Bill 1181 requires that every comprehensive plan in, in the city's planning for under Growth Management Act have to have a climate element in their comprehensive plan. So that element uh, is new and require some technical uh, technical studies that um, we obviously can't do at the staff level. So um, to put together that document, we've enlisted the help of Makers Architecture uh, to lead the climate element development. The, that's what's on your uh, what's on your agenda today is a, is a request to approve that contract with Makers. Uh, Makers also is using Parametrics as a subcontractor to do uh, some, of the, um, some of the further studies, the, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions test, uh, greenhouse gas emissions inventory in particular, and assistance with that issue in the public review process. This uh, document also includes a scope of work, and that's exhibit A of the document, and, and, it's, it, and that document clearly lays out what's expected of the, uh, of the consultants. It uh, also includes a timelines, uh, explaining when various parts of the um, project are going to be taken. Now, those are very general. We also have, we're drafting a uh, a more legible timeline for people to see in chart form. And that's actually available as uh, part of a different project going on at the Planning Commission level. We had a uh, first meeting to review our public participation plan at the last Planning Commission meeting. And then uh, the next Planning Commission meeting is having a public hearing on that public participation plan, which again, will have related to this work and uh, you know, uh, that public participation plan includes this work as well as the rest of the comprehensive plan work and uh, talks uh, to a certain extent about how they're all tied together. And uh, Council Member Walters last week talked about how with this uh, climate element, it really has far reaching effects into the other elements such as the transportation element and the capital facilities element and yes it is a big hairy mess is one way to explain it and we're doing our best to make sure that all of the those tendrils from each of those uh, elements are all cohesive hence the name comprehensive plan um, so the timeline gets a little complicated even though we've tried to simplify it for people to understand that's a little bit of the background. Uh, ultimately today, what we're asking is for the council to approve contract with makers uh, in the amount not to exceed 
$338,351 uh, to develop their comprehensive plan element as required by the Growth Management Act. And I think that means you're ready for council questions. Council. I am ready for council questions. All right. Mayor Miller. Mr. Fantini. Um, so just so that I'm clear, we accepted the $500,000 grant to be used for this process. Exactly. Perfect. Um, the second thing I had, I read all of this. I was great with the deliverables. Um, I really appreciate the Planning Commission's work to come up with a, a, a very public schedule on participation and all that. I did have one question. Um, it refers several times in this to the Climate Policy Advisory Team which sounded like it's made up of a couple members of the public, key stakeholders. How are those folks selected for that client? Because they refer to this CPAT team several times throughout the, um, you know, they're, they're, they're one of the groups that meets about this a lot. How are those people, uh, who are they, and, and how are they selected? Well, we have not selected the, the, the climate policy advisory team yet. Um, we're working on those details, uh, seeing how other jurisdictions have handled this in uh, their jurisdiction. Um, so, you know, it could be as simple as the mayor appointing people, uh, and how that process works, we don't know, but uh, it could be council. Um, we just, we want to, appointing those people. Will make, makers help us with that uh, process? Yeah, or, yeah. Um, makers, we meet, uh, we, we meet regularly uh, with makers to talk about issues, and that's, that's one issue that we'd like to have some guidance on to see. Uh, I think ultimately, though, it's a local decision. Yeah. We're, we're paying them enough, I guess. That's what I, I'm thinking, that they ought to be able to help us with that and look at other jurisdictions. Yeah, yes. Um, they're also helping us with a uh, robust public participation. Um, you know, besides the climate policy advisory team, we plan to have you know regular meetings at the planning commission. Um, uh, and the schedule here identifies when we'll be having drafts of each of the climate element, as well as um, in our public participation plan, we'll uh, we identify when we anticipate to have drafts of the other elements of the comprehensive plan for review and public comment. Um, we're holding uh, makers to commit to at least three in-person presentations from them at key moments during this climate element development to make sure that they're there to help really um, lead the public participation plan, uh, public participation on this. We also, in the public participation plan, talk about other alternate means for uh, this, for receiving comment on the comprehensive plan and the, you know, the, the climate element policy, such as you know, other types of meetings besides just formal meetings in a city council chambers where we uh, can solicit people's um, intra, uh, uh, their comments and get people engaged in this process. One of the requirements of the this process through the state is to make sure that we're uh, including people that are n otherwise don't uh, have the opportunity to participate. Uh, so um, you know, people who are work late or don't have access to internet or don't have um, uh, you know, just maybe language barriers to participating. So we're we're required to have a public outreach program that uh, reaches all segments of the population of the city. Yeah, as to your question, I recall as, uh, during the 2016 comp plan process, there was also a community advisory committee, and I think that was kind of the, uh, built along the, this will be built along the same lines, I think. That's my guess. Thank you. All right, other questions? Mayor Miller. Mr. McDougall. Yeah, for the 2016 process, there was actually, like, my perspective, well, perception is, this is a very well-written document. I think it looks great. Um, the 2016 effort was, by my perception, a much larger update to the comp plan. Like, 
this one, the major update is actually the climate aspect of it, and then like fine tuning of the rest of it, or are there significant changes to the comp plan expected as well? I, I believe you're speaking from experience as somebody who was on the community advisory committee. It so. was about two years. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so we anticipate that this element will have reaching effects into those other elements that I was talking about. Our transportation element, we're proposing a whole new revamp, and yeah. so we also encourage people to take play, uh, take uh, to participate in that uh, plan. And uh, the Public Works Department spearheading that element. Uh, they're creating a traffic master plan that will mm -hmm. double as our uh, as our uh, transportation element of the comp plan. Um, and uh, the housing element will be updated to make sure that it's in uh, reflects the housing action plan that we passed um, early last year. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember what year it is. It, that was in 2023, uh, early in 2023 when the city council approved that. So make sure that that's incorporated into it. Um, and uh, so the land use plan will probably see more than just brush ups because we'll, we, uh, the, the new population and employment projections. We need to make sure that our land use policies and our zoning map are changed to, to accommodate our projected yeah. growth. So, so significant. It, every, uh, this is, this 2025 update is called a periodic update. It's, uh, they happen every 10 years mm -hmm. and they tend to be more significant, much like the 2016 regular update. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. Mayor Miller. Mr. Young. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, of course, um, Mr. Fantini took a bit of the thunder of what I was about to ask because I had the exact same questions, which was also very good. Um, it seems that Makers is, does a lot of work for us at the city. Good quality work is what it's really all about. Part of this um, that I would love to see coming forward too is that um, you know Skagit Transit is in the middle of modifying its future plans, and they've been hosting meetings, you know, throughout Skagit and trying to vision forward where we are and where we want to go from here. And and I would sort of the impact of um, on the environment. I, I guess my hope is that in those other partners that have stakes in this that makers would also reach out to them because all of them are intertwined and working together as you said it is a complex dance that um, i use dance but it's a complex dance of many different factors that need to be evaluated i'm hoping that you know during these um, um, presentations that we might have that we're all having a chance to sort of assess where we are see uh, the progress that's being made, and at the end of the day, um, the results of uh, what we as a city should do, could do, are doing, or may not do, uh, that impacts this. And so I think that the undergirding principle is fact-finding, and so I'm looking forward to it. But, you know, I, I guess early on um, in reading this um, statement of work or this um, proposal here, this contract, you know, I'm looking, f hoping that makers will also meet with um, entities such as Gadget Transit because they're working on their plan now for Anacortes and, um, and uh, Skagit County. So those interworkings are so important and I'm hoping they can be at the table. I'm sure they may already be, but I want to make sure that they do and those other things that um, are, will impact us here. So you bring up a, a good point. The, the transportation part of our element is, is uh, highly integrated into the regional transportation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cars coming to Anacortes are coming from other places or passing mm -hmm. through Anacortes from one place to another. So um, the, the transportation part is, uh, is also um, coordinated through the Skagit Council of Governments, which mm -hmm. is uh, all, of the, all of the cities in, in the county. In, County itself, uh, 
the SCAT has been participating in that regional, uh, the regional discussions um, and uh, coordinating with, with SCOG on that. SCAD and Council of Governments. We also, you know, uh, you, you brought up SCAT as a significant partner in this, as is, you know, our hospital, our school, mm -hmm. uh, the port, the um, refineries. Like, so we, we do, as part of our public participation plan, list off many of these local organizations and, and entities that we plan to target to make sure that they're aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, the population figures drive school uh, capital facilities planning and knowing how many people that they need to accommodate for uh, you know, classrooms and, and teachers. Um, so all of these, you know, population figures highly affect a lot of the entities, not large and small. And so that's why we have this public participation plan and we identify many of those in that plan. I totally, ag I totally agree with, with that approach. I guess just to tweak what I'm um, making sure of is that, you know, in each of those entities and each of those stakeholders, everybody sort of have a piece of the pie that they're operating under. And, you know, whether, and I'm only using uh, Skagit Transit, or we could use the um, refineries, but all of those are part of that impact, uh, supposedly to uh, climate change and the climate element, as well as our plan for how do we begin to address it. And so I guess, you know, and I know this is beyond you, John, and I know you're gonna work on it, and I know you're gonna tweak these things that are there. I just wanted to make sure that makers in their assessment of all of these things, that, you know, the delving deeper into, are they really impacting or not? And if they are, what are the mitigating things that can be done to arrest where we're headed in that impact and then that final result that comes out in the report will be something that we could apply and try to um, you know sort of bring forward as a society or whatever that is thank you you answered my question though your uh, your scat comment is a good segue because we'll have a uh, scadget transit next week i just confirmed that they're, they're able to come to council next week so we could be able to ask them that question directly and um, they're tied in anyway Mr. Walters. Uh, well, I think that this is exciting work. It will be important, though, to do good work, um, not for this to simply be a perfunctory addition, but a, a quality addition to the comp plan. Uh, with respect to the 2016 comp plan, um, I think that could charitably be described as an update. What it really was was the first real comprehensive plan that the city had adopted. Um, it replaced a plan that was really only 20 pages in length. This will be not that scale, but it will be a big update, as uh, the planning director reflected. I expect that the schedule, including the schedule in this contract, will be somewhat fluid because it doesn't take into account the six-month extension that we got uh, from the state. So our plan is now due not midway through 2025, but at the end of 2025. I hope that uh, the planning department will also check in with city council along the way uh, because there are some choices to be made. For example, the housing action plan that we adopted uh, last year was adopted as a menu to be selected from, not necessarily to do all the items that are in that plan, uh, and the adopting resolution reflects that. We added language to the adopting resolution to make it clear, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't spend time debating each and every measure in there because we figured that that debate comes later. Uh, we just took the work of the consultant and adopted it so that we have uh, completed that exercise and we have that menu to choose from. Um, another, for example, uh, we're getting a greenhouse gas inventory as part of this contract. Uh, I think that that will be very uh, illuminating. We do have one that was created in 2006 as part of the city's climate action plan back then, a plan that was created with the help of ICLEI. Yes, the conspiracy runs deep here. Uh, that may be very informative for the rest of the work that we do. Uh, you know, what the greenhouse gas inventory reflects. Uh, transportation coordination, I think, is also key, and Mr. Young's point about scattered transit is very well taken. Uh, many of these things and the approaches to them can be teased out in the public participation plan, so we look forward to that coming forward. Um, but as I said before, I think we also need to adopt um, a scope for the comprehensive plan update. 
uh, because there may be other items that we want to accomplish as part of the update, non-required items, but just things that reflect our vision. So um, I think it would be appropriate to talk about that uh, when we talk about the public participation plan. The item in front of us, just this contract though, I think is, is ready to go um, and will accomplish what we need with respect to the consultant. So I move that we authorize the mayor to sign the contract as presented. Second. Okay, a motion by Mr. Walters and a second by Mr. Fantini to approve the uh, contract 21-120 PLN 002 with Makers Architecture and Urban Design in the amount of 338351 to perform Anacortes climate element. Any additional discussion? Mr. Franciak, take the vote, please. Mr. Young. Yes. Mr. Walters. Yes. Ms. Moulton. Yes. Mr. McDougall. Yes. Ms. Hubick. Yes. Mr. Pantini. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, next up is item 6B. This is a contract award, Thompson Trail Trestle and Causeway Replacement Project. It's a discussion item, possible action, and I bet Mr. Lunsford has already made his way to the podium, and he has. Mr. Lunsford. Mayor Miller, thank you, council members. I apologize for my voice in advance of a little bit of a cold. So tonight we have the opportunity to look at this contract before you with uh, Hanson <coughs> Consulting and it's regarding the Thompson Trail Trestle Feasibility Study that we are working on um, and have been on for some time through a grant with the Recreation Conservation Office. Let's just get going. So it's a partnership, this project, with the uh, City of Anacortes, Samish Indian Nation, and the Washington State Department of Natural Resources. We have some other people that are working on this, other organizations. The uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has offered their support and consulting with us, which is a great addition to us as well as working on a future hopeful uh, interlocal with Skagit County to do some more education outreach through the Marine Resource Committee. So the project's a collaboration, a collaborative effort between Samish, uh, D, uh, Washington State DNR, and the city of Anacortes. The city owns the trail, therefore we're the lead agency. We applied for the grant. So it originated via the grant with the Recreation Conservation Office and their estuary and salmon restoration program. So it's an environmental conservation grant that also has a recreational purpose to look at the feasibility of replacing the trestle and causeway. So the grant amount that we have right now is 360, the contract before you is 350, and we may come to you in the future with modifications to that if uh, we have other partners joining us. So let's just take a look. So Hanson Professional Services, Inc. The scope of work in a nutshell is the feasibility of removing and replacing the existing causeway and trestle. So uh, one of the reasons we're looking at that is the health of the bay, uh, the idea of removing the um, trestle and the causeway would increase water flow in and help the uh, circulation of the water in the bay, uh, restoring it to what it was prior to that, so uh, 100 years ago, uh, hopefully with improving eelgrass beds and habitat for salmon and salmonoid species. So, I, so that's the ultimate go. And so this is a feasibility study to look at Will that work? What will be the cost of that? And what would that look like? So, um, as I mentioned before, uh, I think that most people would like to see a trestle that doesn't burn down. Um, <clears throat> it's not susceptible to that. We're also looking at a trestle that doesn't have 800 roughly creosote pilings in the bay and what it would take to remove that and what that would do for the health of the bay and removing the ancient riprap that's there and understanding what's underneath it. So that's all part of this work. Um, as the mayor and I spoke previously, it's just to get to about 15% this grant, about 15% of the study. We'd have to go much further, 30, 60%, but the idea is that we do this work, get a sense of it, and bring it back to you as the public's representatives to understand what the community would be committing towards. Do we want to keep going? Do we like what we're learning? Is it helpful? Do we want to go out for larger grants and do more study and then <clears throat> make a plan? For ultimately, this will be a, a large project most likely in the tens of millions of dollars. And the community has to be ready for that. We would go for outside sources. This is all grant funding and matched through the Samish Nation, through their generosity that they've received during, through grants. And the state is helping us as well. So it'd be a large lift for the community and to uh, kind of undo 100 years of, of, eco, of environmental 
uh, degradation and changes there that aren't perhaps the best for Fidalgo Bay. So that's what we're looking at. So you get the chance to review this before we go forward with it. That's the whole essence of the feasibility study and the contract that's here before you. So some elements of that contract are the geotechnical report, essentially understanding what is inside that causeway. Will we boring into it? <clears throat> for the public, that means we'd be closing the trail periodically with advance notice. These are small boreholes, but to get that rig there and to go down deep enough to understand what's there, we need to, for the public safety, to close the trail periodically to do that. And it would be something that would be short-lived and for the public safety. And so we would try to avoid, you know, large holiday weekends and things of that nature. But that would be something we'd, wor we'd be working on as a city to let folks know about. A bathymetric survey or a survey of the topography underneath the water, uh, a survey of the land mass as well, of what makes up the causeway, its, its, um, its mass and depth. Um, studies of what would make a good replacement, you know, an, an essence of that, because we are not getting into a structural analysis of that at a 15% design. It's very small, but we're looking at more the science. What would be the, uh, what's going to happen once we start to remove the creosote pilings? How's that going to affect the bay? How are we going to plan to do that without transporting 80 years of pollutant polluted sediments around the bay. Can that be done? How would that be done? Those are things that we're going to try to understand. Um, <clears throat> there's a public education element. Um, part of that will be coming through the final report. The Hansen and their crew would come here and talk to you and the public through this, through this uh, um, forum to let them know what the final report says and to explain that to them. Um, we're working on the side with the uh, MRC, the Marine Resource Committee of the county to develop a, a public outreach strategy during the process. The public understands why we're doing it, what we're doing it, making their scientists available. That will come to you in the future. It's not part of this contract. So I hope that in a nutshell gives you a sense of what we're looking at. If you have specific questions, I'm more than happy to try to answer them about this contract. Uh, Mr. Young. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, Mr. Lunford, you know, I, I want to start out with a compliment. Um, the details with which you bring forward your presentations is superb. The depth with which you discuss and try to begin to address the issues that may be associated with any project is, um, is comprehensive and um, very well received. This is no different than that. Um, but, you know, again, I do like to pay compliments when we lean into other things. In this case, you know, I, I really love the idea of a partnership that's taking place. We're getting, beginning to address some of the challenges environmentally for the health of our bay. You know, um, you know whether it's the, I think it was a, I think, Mayor, you and I talked about it once, was it was a National Geographic study in the 1970s or somewhere up in there. About Geograss. Y it, yes, okay. Um, but it was, it was stunning. And so where we are now in our quest to sort of recover as much as we can healthily and enjoy the quality of life we do in the very things that we love about what makes Anacortes and Fidalgo Island home, I, I applaud that. And so I'm looking forward to it, um, uh, figuring out how we can do it. The mayor and I talked about eelgrass restoration. I've talked to Ms. Henneberg, uh, uh, other um, stakeholders in trying to assess, do we have enough? Is it enough? And then how do we improve it? Because so much of the crab, the, the fish, so much of who we are and what we are um, is surrounding that question. So to get to the bottom of where we really are, you know, whether uh, it's what we need to do, whether it's toxic, what, whatever it is, we will find out. And so I applaud this and really just wanted, I'm glad to see this moving forward. Um, I think questions that anyone may have will um, be coming forward and it will create an opportunity for both um, supportive and opposing views and those in the middle to be able to come forward and learn and then we'll figure out how do we do it together but uh, I just really wanted to applaud this effort and uh, I, I like what I'm seeing so thank you thank you mr. young and, and uh, maybe just for a little more public uh, education on this project we kind of a, we have a good idea I think we all know that hundreds of creosote piles are not good for the bay uh, but what we need to really figure out is, number one, what's inside the, uh, the riprap, the, uh, the fill, 
and this will this will help us determine. And then ultimately, uh, it'll be for the uh, to be able to make that decision for council on you know what is the cost benefit and of to imp improving the. Uh, the bay and improving the trestle that doesn't uh, catch on fire so easily. Those are kind of my two big things. We get get to improve the bay and not uh, not to have a flammable bridge. Yeah. Are, are two good things. Mayor Miller, Mr. Walters, uh, I've been very supportive of this project for a long time, and I'm really glad to see it moving forward. Now, this is a great potential uh, project. Uh, I, I think of like Taylor Dock in Bellingham, the concrete and steel surface. Um, and the ability to have a smooth surface for bikes and strollers and walkers um, while still providing light down below, all steel and cement, no creosote. Um, I understand that creosote might have limited pollutant capability if it's not disturbed, but I understand as well that the removal of the riprap is pretty key to restoring sediment migration around the bay. So, um, I'm very supportive of the project and of this contract to do the work to figure out, you know, what the contours of the potential project would look like. Um, when it comes up, and I expect it will come up in a variety of contexts, how will we fund the resulting project that comes out of this design and, and more design later? Um, I, I don't expect the city will ever fund the project. Uh, we inherited this trestle. We did not construct it. Well twice constructed some repairs, but, um, uh, you know, we inherited this problem, uh, and it's a problem that really belongs to all of us. Uh, so DNR has multiple times offered to help us find grant money, there are federal, potentially federal sources of grant money, uh, to re replace this thing may cost, in, I mean, it will cost in excess of $10 million, and that price tag is going up all the time. So it will never rise to the level of a number one priority for the city when we have a structure that is currently functioning. So I, I, I think it's pretty safe to be able to say the city is not gonna put local money in any substantial amount into this. What we are trying to do is facilitate, because we are the owner, we're trying to uh, facilitate the analysis so that we have a price tag so that somebody could come along and, and write us a check, or as quite likely, quite a few different checks to help pay for the whole project. Uh, but the environmental benefit could be very significant, um, and obviously people have been interested in it for quite some time because of that potential environmental benefit. So I'm excited to see it moving forward. Thank you very much for, for moving this forward. Thank you, Mr. Walters. Mayor Miller. Ms. Hubick. Thank you. I agree with everything that's been said so far. That water has been here for longer than any of us. It's been longer than the trestle and it deserves our respect and we have to take care of it. So I'm really looking forward to the work that's gonna be put into this. 15% feels like a very small number, but if it's done correctly, it can answer a lot of questions and provide a lot of guidance to us as we start to move forward on a very big and yes, very expensive project. So um, I'll move that the city authorize the mayor to sign contract 23-092-PRK-001 with Hanson Professional Services in the amount of $350,000 to perform the Thompson Trail Trestle and Causeway Replacement Project design. Motion by Ms. Ubik and a second by Mr. Walters to approve the uh, contract as presented. Any additional discussion? Mr. Franciak, vote please. Mr. Walters. Ms. Moulton? Yes. Mr. McDougal? Yes. Ms. Hubick? Yes. Mr. Fantini? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Next up is item 6C, the contract award, Microsoft Enterprise Agreement, Office 365 Renewal. It's a discussion item with possible action, and Ms. Shu is already at the podium, but I probably did not drag it out long enough where you can open your presentation. But there you go. Ms. Shu, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, council members, the audience tonight, I'm here to present our uh, Office 365 2024 annual renewal. This is the year two of a three-year agreement in the amount of $122,930.45. Uh, we participate in the Washington State Master uh, Contract through the NASBO Value Point Agreement uh, that helps to, to set the, the pricing for us. As many of you are aware, our 
subscription services have changed. Um, and so the city basically rents the use of the Microsoft applications. The, you probably have heard of SaaS, the subscription, excuse me, software as a subscription. So it's within the, you know, the, the last decade or so has really been a change in, in the way that we obtain the, the software services that we need at the city. Uh, we do confirm that the government tenancy is hosted within the United States and that this helps us to, to meet our PCI, our HIPAA, and our CJS, our criminal justice um, requirements. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. All right, questions for Ms. Shu. Mayor Miller. Mr. Fantini. I just have one question. What does CJIS stand for? The Criminal Justice Information Systems. Thank you. So n information related to our police department um, that needs to be secure. Perfect, thank you. Mr. McDougall. Just a very quick question. So the, the general like license across the entire city, that covers things like Microsoft Word in the cloud and Excel and kind of the, the basics. And then everybody's Outlook email. And then is it additional licensing? Well, also the, uh, I guess the collaboration tools that we use not for city council meetings per se, but committee meetings and just within staff, uh, Microsoft Teams. Are there any other, like I know there's other products like the uh, Microsoft's, oh, like PowerPoint or their um, <coughs> project management software. Are those tied into this as well or are those more like individual licenses? Uh, those are included. So Microsoft has different um, levels thing. of licenses. And mm -hmm. so depending on what the, the need of the, the employee mem member um, or the, the council member, uh, we help to determine which license that they get. Um, and, and some are more robust than, than others. But yes, uh, you're talking about the, the PowerPoint, the, the Teams, the, the SharePoint servers. Those are included as part of this agreement. All right. Thank you. Mayor Miller. Mr. Young. Ms. Shu, just one point um, I guess I um, think it's important to mention. Where we have in the summary the contract piggybacks on Washington State's master contract, value point master agreement. That affects pricing. That gives us better pricing if we joined in on that versus trying to do it ourselves. And yes, so when there are master agreements in place, that means that an, a larger entity has done the negotiation work mm -hmm. and there's an agreement that um, other entities, and this may not be the right contracting legal word for it, but can piggyback or utilize that same contract. So um, there's, there's more time to, to be able to, to get the services than you need than to have Microsoft taking the, the time to try and negotiate with each and every entity. Thank you. You answered my question. Mayor Miller. Mr. Walters. I appreciate that we're using the software as a services model now. It's substantially easier for limited in-house tech staff to manage versus an on-premises system. Um, have we yet eliminated all of our on-prem servers? We have. Perfect. Uh, we did this a number, we switched to software as a service a number of years ago and there was a phase out period and I'm glad to hear that we've made that progress. I think that that makes a lot of sense. You pay a slightly higher price probably for uh, software as a service, but it also means that you're offloading uh, all of that responsibility to manage the system. Um, not all of it, because obviously there's some uh, configuration steps that need to happen, but a substantial amount of it to the people that are the experts, which in this case is Microsoft itself. Uh, I move that uh, City Council authorize the mayor to sign the contract as presented. Motion by Mr. Walters and a second by Ms. Hubick to uh, authorize me to sign contract 24-113 ITS-001 with SHI International Corp in the amount of 122-930-45 for a Microsoft Enterprise Agreement, Office 365 renewal. Any additional discussion? Mr. Francis, I vote, please. Ms. Moulton. Yes. Mr. McDougall. Yes. Ms. Hubick. Yes. Mr. Fantini. Yes. Mr. Young. Yes. Mr. Walters. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, saving the big one for last, uh, item 6D. This is a contract award, wastewater treatment plant outfall relocation, marine and upland. This is a discussion item with possible action. 
Mr. Rayum is already there. Mr. Rayum. Good evening, good evening Mayor and Council, Andy Rayum, Public Works Director. Uh, before you is a contract with Strider Construct in Construction incorporated in the amount of $16,532,312. There's some change, but I left that off. Uh, to build a new wastewater treatment plant outfall, including 1,631 feet of 48 inch diameter pipe from the plant to the shoreline, 1,030 feet of 42 inch pipe from the shoreline into the Guaymas Channel. And then finally, with a 86-foot diffuser at the end of the uh, pipe to discharge the treated sewage. This project is necessary because the current sewer out plant outfall pipe was damaged by a storm in 2019. The storm was declared a disaster. Uh, FEMA is funding this project 100%. Uh, the project will last uh, 400 calendar days. Uh, once it starts and should be completed sometime in May of 2025. Uh, this contract was added to this council meeting late because it was the last meeting before the bids expired. Uh, the city needed to either accept a bid or reject all bids by April 14th, which was a Sunday. So I figured you'd rather have it late on the agenda than a special meeting. Uh, the original posting of the contract was also erroneous. We also point out by a uh, resident, which we appreciate that. Uh, it had been updated online. Th it has been updated online and in your packet for consideration tonight. The error was a portion of the contract um, that was from a version of the contract when this project was two different projects. And so it, it uh, was confusing for that one section. So we just took it out. It was unnecessary to be in the contract to begin with. A couple of other questions which we received in advance, which I appreciate. Um, the, the project website is up to date and current today. Uh, the schedule for the project will be established by the contract contractor once they are under a contract. So they, they tell us what they're going to do in the phases and the schedule. And then the last part, uh, as part of the contract scope for blasting, um, blasting is there's rock and we need to put a, you know, 40 some inch pipe into that rock. So we need to blast down into the rock. It's not like a plunger blasting like you saw in cartoons when you were a kid. It's very controlled and um, intentional. And, but anyhow, the, in, in the scope, the, the blasting does include a third-party pre-blast survey of all properties within 200 feet of the proposed blasting and surveys post-construction. Uh, of course, you don't have to let them into your house if you don't want to, but it is a service we are offering with the project. And that is my presentation. Okay, I know there's going to be some questions because uh, I know council, we've, we've, council, you all have been here before with a contract that we tried to do a couple of years ago now, and uh, now we're back, a really important project for our city, but uh, council. Mayor Miller. Mr. Walters. Um, I appreciate that Public Works has spent quite a number of weeks going through the bids, making sure that they are consistent with the requirements, including uh, the permits that we have for this project. Uh, we don't have the entirety of the contract in front of us. We, you know, have the agreement and not all of the other contract documents. Um, so we're not able to fully evaluate it, nor is it within most of our skill sets. Uh, so uh, we probably ought not to try. But I certainly appreciate the uh, public comment that identified a problem with it. I, I would just ask um, the city attorney uh, to confirm that she has reviewed the contract. Ms. Swetnam. Uh, thanks for the question. I've reviewed the contract a lot. So <laughs> Figured and, that and that I, had to be the case, yes. I think it's a good contract. The contract specialist has spent time with it on the contract. Uh, we've worked with the consultants, engineers, and probably spent more time on this contract than any other one we've looked at, so. As, as one might expect, because the value of the contract is 16 plus million dollars. We just simply don't have a um, you know, checkbox for that. Uh, so can, can you, Mr. Ayum, can you tell us a little bit about the schedule? Because I know that that's going to be uh, a big ongoing question throughout the 400 plus days of the contract. Tell, tell you a bit more about the schedule, how? Schedule of the work and specifically with respect to its potential impacts on neighboring land uses. So we won't know that until the contractors on board, they have kind of their latitude on how they want to, they see fit to do it. The, probably the biggest driving force about which do you do the marine or the upland part first will be dependent on the fish window. 
So we have some regulations that we can't be out there in the Guaymas Channel doing things during uh, migratory times of the year, and so we have to avoid those. So I imagine if they're you know, getting down to that, they won't start the marine part and they'll keep working on the upland part of the project. And uh, I think we know when the fish window is because it was in one of the NEPA documents. Um, I hadn't seen the website um, for the project, which I guess was updated today. Uh, will, will we be doing affirmative outreach to the neighborhood with the website on an ongoing basis? Yes. Okay. Yes, we need to. It's a, it's a pretty, pretty intense project, for, yeah. especially for the neighborhood. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I think that the neighborhood especially, um, you know, will definitely feel the impacts, but also uh, tenants of the port, other users in that area, uh, traffic transiting through there to go to other neighborhoods. Um, I, I don't think that, um, I don't think we can over communicate on this project. So I would, in, I would encourage us to do as much as we can there. We did preemptively um, discuss things with the port and they're very open and willing to work with us and making sure that you know, we, d we do coordinate just that because uh, it could impact their operations, so, as well as the neighborhood. Other questions for Mr. Ayum? Mayor Miller. Mr. Walters. Um, would you also just describe how you vetted the contractors? The how you confirmed that they are qualified to do this work and will do a good job? Sure. It was probably the most intense that I've seen. We hired an actual third party outside the design engineering firm to review the packets. We did all the reference checks. We turned over every rock possible. Uh, like uh, the city attorney said, I haven't seen anything like this before for the vetting process. So we're, especially because of the history with this project, I think we want to make sure this one goes smoothly. And so we did everything we could to make sure it goes smoothly. And uh, as a result, the selected contractor has experience doing this type of in-water work. Yep. Plus and the blasting. And the blaster also yeah. has experience, yep. Mayor Muller. Ms. Sweatham. Just to provide some additional insight on that, we worked with a consultant to build in supplemental criteria that addressed experience with the various challenging aspects of the project, like going through an environmental cleanup site, which is there, the Port's got a log yard cleanup site, also blasting both in terms of the company and in terms of its, um, its uh, superintendents and its, and its staff. Um, and so there was really thorough look at the specific qualifications that were necessary for this project. And I think that we built um, really thoughtful and intentional supplemental criteria and then, and then did um, not just a check in the block review of those criteria, but really leaned into the, the background of the contractor to make a right choice. And, and another very important aspect, we've got all the permits now. We do have the permits at hand, yes. Maybe we got a little ahead of ourselves uh, before. And, uh, again, you weren't you weren't here for this one, uh, Mr. Am, but uh, I, I know I you, you're well aware. Yes. All right. Other questions? Mayor Miller, Mr. Young. In lieu of any further questions, and um, and to get this show on the road, I like that word. Um, I move that City Council authorize the mayor to sign contract 20-032-SEW-009 with Snyder Construction Company, Inc., in the amount of $16,532,312.32 to perform the wastewater treatment plant outfall relocation. Second. Motion by Mr. Young, a second by Mr. McDougall to approve the contract as presented. Any additional discussion? Mr. Franciak? Mr. McDougall? Yes. Ms. Hebeck? Yes. Mr. Mantini? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Mr. Walters? Yes. Ms. Moulton? Yes. Motion carries. All right, we'll get this one done. Uh, item seven is uh, nothing before the council, so I will adjourn tonight's meeting. Have a good night.